Welcome to another episode of the All Turtles Podcast, a show about entrepreneurship and AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder at All Turtles. Today, Jessica Colley and I interview Jake Ward, the former editor-in-chief of Popular Science Magazine and tech correspondent for Al Jazeera, and as a Stanford Bergruen Fellow, is in the midst of writing a book on behavioral science and AI. He shares some insights with us on the dangers of handing off important decision-making to AI and the long-term effect that can have on humans' critical thinking. Then, Phil Libin, Jessica, and I dive into our eye roll please segment to ask why people advise startup founders to not take too much money, which leads to a discussion about why control is an illusion. We also take a listener question about the future of robotics. So Jessica and I are here in the studio with Jake Ward, a tech journalist, Bergruen fellow, who, among many things, you're also writing a book on AI right now. I am. Um, Jake, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. So what what is a Bergruen fellow? Can you take us through what that means? Sure. So I am a fellow at a program called the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. CASBUS is the way it's pronounced. And it's a Stanford fellowship program that's most famous for, um, it's it's basically, it's the behavioral sciences. So it's political science, it's psychology, it's all kinds of different things. uh, sciences and the, it's best known for uh, people like uh, Daniel Kahneman did some of his uh, earliest oh, work yes. there. Richard Thaler came up with behavioral uh, economics in part from during his time as a fellow there. Uh, and Bergruen is uh, an institute uh, uh, out of Los Angeles that um, is about sort of the among many things they're interested in the philosophy of technology, philosophical effects of technology, and so they are my funder. So I am a Bergruen fellow at Casbus this year, which is a mouthful. But a very, very proud mouthful. It's a very cool thing. That's super cool. What what types of things are you working on or researching? Yeah, so they are funding in part my book uh, and the time that it takes to write that book. And the being around the other fellows is the really amazing part. So the point of my book is trying to connect uh, aspects of behavioral um, science to uh, aspects of AI that I'm seeing deployed in the wild. And uh, so there's 30 something other fellows and they include specialists in disinformation. There's an amazing trio of women who are working. They're like the number one experts on uh, uh, sexual assault and the way that institutions betray the victims of sexual assault. Um, I've got a primatologist. I've got the former president of Estonia who digitized democracy in his country. So it's this, you know, you literally cannot swing your keyboard without whacking somebody that can tell you on, you know, is somebody super quotable about uh, uh, something that, in my case, connects to typically AI. Super qu- quotable, like, you know, swinging a keyboard to whack somebody. Yeah, like super, <laughs> like like, that. exactly. That's kind of the kind of quotable <laughs> thing. You know, just every single, you know, it's it, typically, it's a journalist's dream to l- literally just be happen to be having lunch with people who are heavyweight enough that you could, you know, defend putting them in your piece. And I literally, every single person, I'm like, oh, you you absolutely qualify. You are the world expert on this thing. So it's been an amazing experience. Do you do you have a background in behavioral sciences? How did you come to this? I don't. I am a straight journalist. I come from a long line of journalists, and uh, and that's been my thing. So ever since I was 23, I started out as a uh, writer for a magazine called The Industry Standard, which was the first uh, magazine to really like try to cover the internet as a business disruptor. And then I went on to – I was an intern at Wired back in the day, and I, I eventually became – my most recent uh, uh, sort of last gig in in print journalism was I was the editor-in-chief of Popular Science magazine. Um, and so I, I have throughout my life been focused mostly on what at Popular Science we called the hard, fast, and shiny of tech. Uh, so, you know, the stuff people make from nuclear weapons to spaceships. Uh, but uh, in the last few years, I, I got to do this amazing stint as a television correspondent at Al Jazeera, which got me to sort of connect social justice questions to my coverage of tech, which is what uh, Al Jazeera is about. And then coming out of that, I got to do a three-year, uh, or no, sorry, two, two and a half-year project, a documentary called Hacking Your Mind, which is coming out next year. That's a kind of crash course in the cutting edge of behavioral science uh, for uh, a sort of Nova PBS audience. Mm. It's, it's probably going to air on public television. And so that was this amazing ability to, you know, we, to meet Thaler and Kahneman and all these sort of, you know, Mazur and Banaji, all these big names of, of behavioral science. And in coming out of that, I thought, okay, what am I going to do now with this amazing 
uh, you know, there's, there's a pattern here. What do I do with it? And I figured, oh, wow, uh, AI is, is, seems to be setting off a lot of the patterns of human behavior that these people have been studying all this time. How can I combine those two things? And that's how the book began. Can, can you dive into that a bit? How is AI setting off? And should we be optimistic, Pess- so, pessimistic? Well, so there's a little bit of both. A uh, little, well, you know, I, I don't know what the balance is yet, right. but there's both, definitely. Um, the stuff that uh, gets set off, I mean, so so the big, you know, the, the sort of big and overly broad summary I'd offer of, of the way that behavioral science is looking at things lately is, you know, within the last sort of 40 years, we figured out that there are these sort of programmatic ways, systematic ways that human beings make decisions, especially when they're deprived of either time or information. So when you're resource strapped, your brain just clicks into mm. uh, habits. And Conrad and Tversky were very famous for for figuring out a bunch of those things like, why do you associate bad news you saw on on nightly news with uh, your own life? Why do you think that when you see a plane crash that you should cancel your own vacation plans by plane? These sort of irrational decisions that we make, our tendency to group people that we, uh, you know, have seen, you know, to associate, to stereotype people, you know, all of these sorts of, of cognitive habits that we have. Um, I see them playing into AI in a handful of ways. I mean, one big and really well-established part of, of behavioral science is the field of anthropomorphism, is falling in love with a system you don't understand and accepting its uh, verdict simply because it's too complex for you to f- figure out. Um, people study acquiescence in that uh, realm. One of the psychological parallels is uh, superstition. You know, why do I, as someone who, who uh, you know, did not grow up in the church, freak out when my daughter opens an umbrella in the house? You know, the, your, your brain just goes, I don't know, but I'm just going to go with this system. And one of the pivotal problems you see, I think, in, in AI, and I, I, I bump into this all the time in my reporting, is, you know, your, your average ML-based system right now is a pattern recognition It's a statistics machine, right? And it kicks out a a probabilistic answer, 87% chance of this. Human beings, this is another really well-established cognitive uh, pattern, are terrible at statistics. Human beings cannot process statistics. There's a thing called prospect theory. It's a very famous uh, finding from Kahneman and Tversky that was carried into behavioral economics. And it basically says that, that human beings, we suck so bad at statistics that we, we collapse them into five. We can only do five kinds of statistics uh, in our brains. We can do 100%, 0%, 99%, 1%, and 50-50. <laughs> that you, you give me a 73% chance of a thing happening, and my brain either makes that 99% or 50-50. I can't do 73%. And yet, as you guys know, every one of these systems comes out with, okay, there's a, you know, based on all the available information, uh, 73% chance of this thing happening. And so how does a human handle that? We don't know yet. You know, that's, that's not a thing that, that human beings have, have practiced in interacting with AI yet. What's your assessment with how the media generally is covering this topic? Yeah, well, you know, I, I get asked a lot when, when people hear that I'm investigating the human interactions with AI, they tend to, people, you know, and I and present company accepted because you guys are obviously thinking about this on a, on a very granular level, but your average person who just thinks about AI thinks, oh, do you mean the Terminator? You must mean the, the enslavement of human beings by some right. sort of external robot brain. And I say, no, guys, what I'm worried about is the enslavement of human beings by the wrong aspects of our own brain. You know, one of the big uh, patterns in in uh, the work of Kahneman and Tversky was this idea that we have a fast thinking brain and a slow thinking brain. Your fast thinking brain you've had around for at least 30 million years. It's like totally evolution refined and it's the instinctive means by which you make so many of your decisions. Um, you know, it drives your car for you. It does all, I mean, researchers have shown that it actually votes for you, which we're, which we should all be alarmed by. But, you know, that kind of instinctive decision making is, is carrying you through the vast majority of the day. The thing that makes us human is our slow thinking brain, which is hugely expensive. It's a, it costs an incredible number of calories. It's hard to use. And it's our creative, rational, uh, you know, logical system for, um, you know, having the big thoughts that, that got us to stand up and walk out of Africa 70,000 years ago. The, my thesis is if you hand all of the really difficult decision making to an AI driven system or company or industry or whatever you want to call it, you're going to lose that slow thinking muscle over time. And I think as we see people trying to apply AI to all sorts of 
uh, tedious, morally difficult, you know, complicated stuff, it's going to mean that human beings are not going to be as used to grappling with that stuff in their minds. And they're going to say, well, I don't know. AI says this is the guy to surveil. We're going to follow him around. Right, right. And so that's, that's my worry is giving up some really fundamental human decision-making capabilities, critical faculties that I think might sort of uh, fade away over time. Yeah. I mean, I, we're kind of, we're swimming in more data and information about people than we ever have before. Right. And if, you know, if our brains can't actually process statistics that fall somewhere in the middle, like 73%, I kind of wonder, and I'm curious what you think about this, mm -hmm. I wonder if more information or less information is the answer to that problem, right? If like if people automatically round radically down or radically up when presented with a number that's somewhere in the middle, should we be doing things like political polling that's made public? Right, 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 right. So I think that's a fascinating question. And and my, my wildly ambitious uh, goal in this book is to try to subdivide the problem as much as I can, because it's so overwhelming. Because then because th we fall into these questions of, you know, I, I have the same question, like, should we have less information in that circumstance, more information? I'm not sure. You know, in the in the, the fellowship that I'm in right now, I'm surrounded by political scientists, all of whom say gathering political sentiment through polling data is the dumbest way to figure out how people actually feel about a thing. Mm. Human beings have no idea how they feel about a thing politically. They just gather around the strongest person they can find, basically. Which is the fast-thinking brain, probably. The fast-thinking brain, right, making yeah. your decision for you in the, in the political realm, exactly. And so the problem with then gathering automatically, as many systems attempt to, you know, sentiment from social media or whatever it is, is... Or is, language, right? Natural language right, processing. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Then does that actually reflect who we are? Maybe, maybe not. We don't really know. You know, I've been trying to look for analogous areas of research that we could sort of connect to that I... You know, I don't know about you guys, but I find that people in in tech in general and, and oftentimes in AI in particular are just allergic to history mm -hmm. <laughs> in many ways. They don't like to think about things outside of their their you know, their job set. Well, I think it's a little bit of a hubristic sense that who cares what happened previously? Yeah. We can shape the future right. anyway. We're disrupting this. We're making right. it better. I think that's right. And the and so I'm I'm hoping to try to make it cool on some level to look at some analogous areas of research that people haven't looked at before. So, you know, one of them that I, I am really interested by is um, there's a principle in in the legal realm uh, called weak perfection. Somebody, a federal judge was just describing this to me the other day. And it was it's the idea that there are many things you could make more efficient about the legal system. So one of them, for instance, is the guilty or not guilty plea that you enter in court. That process is arduous. It's incredible. It's a total pain. But the the reason is they make you do five or six steps and do go to all these appearances and so forth so that you cannot make an efficient decision about it. So you have to slow down and make a slow decision about it because you'll never take that decision back and it's about to change your life. And so, you know, principles like weak perfection or I look at, at some of the game theorists from the Cold War who were looking at what kind of decisions should we be making when nuclear missiles are actually coming in at us. You know, there's a, there's a quest for efficiency – which I think we all are really familiar with and which we're all making an incredible amount of money off of, not me, but a lot of people are. Uh, but is efficiency always going to be the answer? I think we're at a place where we're seeing that that may not be the case. And so that's, that's, I'm looking at places where people have been intentionally inefficient to see if there's something we can, we can learn in this realm. Are there some more practical real world examples that you can dive into there? Yeah, sure. So let's see other places of, of, of sort of intentionally slowing down. I mean, you know, we have come up with with legal strictures or, you know, si sort of systems. And I don't know that these are perfectly parallel or that they work out perfectly. But there are are ways in which I look at things like um, uh, I've been looking a lot lately at these things called vac the vaccine courts. So this is a, a special federal structure, legal structure that's separate from the laws that you and I obey each day. And they're set up specifically to incentivize vac uh, pharmaceutical companies to continue to make vaccines, even though about a thousand people a year are paralyzed and in some cases even killed owing to a syndrome that the that vaccine set off. Now, this is totally separate from the craziness about vaccines and, and autism. This is not in any way connected to that, but it is a, uh, a, 
a there is an actual health outcome for this very small but statistically significant group of people that uh, you know has huge ramifications and people have set up a a court with a special master that you as the parent of a child who's been affected by this or the family members or the individual who's been affected can go and apply for a remedy to this court. And within about a year, year and a half, you get a payout that's incredibly specific. Hmm. Uh, it's like a million and a half to somewhere like two and a half million dollars. I mean, it's literally the cost of the life that has been ruined by this thing. And I look at that and I think, I don't know, like maybe we're smarter than we think in a regulatory sense for coming up with, you know, a cost to society for a thing and yet wanting to incentivize society to continue making an important technology like, like vaccines, which inoculate us against this, these, you know, keep us from being vectors on these huge things. So it's, I don't know. it's literally the cost of like, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. It's That's the right. cost of the egg. That's right. That it's the cost broken. of the egg. They, uh, there's a thing, there's a principle from the thirties, um, justice learned hand who was a, a federal, um, uh, is that a real name? It's his real name. I've it's never an, even isn't heard that, that amazing? Before. Yeah. <laughs> learned hand. First Sounds name, like learned, a metal band. second hand, the hand. I know, right? I know exactly. I love the t-shirt. <laughs> oh, was he, a, was, was he a Puritan descent? Do you think? I have no doubt. I have no idea, but I have no doubt. I'm sure that's right. Um, but he was a very famous, uh, uh, person for dealing at the time with these sort of big, you know, these big questions that modern society were, were giving us. And one of them was, um, basically a, a barge company tied up its barge wrong and wound up, uh, wrecking all of these other barges on this waterfront, destroying this waterfront in New York city. And this lawsuit was basically saying these guys should be held liable for all of the damage that their barge did. And the company argued, well, we can't possibly pay enough pay enough night watchmen to do this the right way so it shouldn't be our responsibility. And so he came up with this thing called the hand rule, which is still used today. And the hand rule says the cost to society of doing without the safety technology should be compared to the cost to the company of building that the safety into their thing that they've made. And if one outweighs the other, then that determines culpability. And so, you know, we could make cars that cost $5 million a piece and no one ever gets killed in, right? But the companies, it's been determined by by that kind of math that the companies shouldn't bear that responsibility, you know, that much responsibility. They have an incredible responsibility, but not that much responsibility. And so as we move into a world where uh, in AI, right, we're seeing incredible, we're going to see incredible benefits in medical, in, you know, uh, all sorts of incredible pattern recognition. And yet we're also going to see some sort of secondary negative effect. What, how will, the, how will we apply the hand rule there? I don't know. I don't know yet. But. Yeah. Who's, who's the arbiter of those ethical decisions? Well, I think the, the Supreme Court will wind up oh, being, God. you know, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, for better, or for worse, right. We're going to need, we're going to need, uh, people in, uh, Washington to, to look at this stuff. I mean, it's not just the court though, right? It's like we're, it's, I think the fact that we're, we live in a capitalist society means that sort of the, the economics of AI probably drive more of the ethics than anything else. Hugely so, right? We've certainly seen that to be the case. I mean, the thing for me is I, I feel like we are at a stage where the economics of it can, you know, I, I don't know that we can get a lot more economic argument for this stuff out of it. I mean, I was looking mm -hmm. at it, I was looking at the other day at you know, there, there was this when, – back when I was at Al Jazeera, there was this stat that came out, the Pew uh, – uh, a Pew study came out that said 49 – this was in 2016 – 49 percent of Americans can get – have it to put together an extra $400 in an emergency. One in two. One in two people can can afford an extra 400 bucks. That's a parking ticket. That's you – you know, you got your car booted. It's a mistake. Right? It's one mistake yeah. and you're off the board. And so I don't know that I think we need that much more economic efficiency in the United States right now. I think we're pretty much getting people down to, to where they can just barely put the food on the table. So I think we're good on, a, you know, on the economic argument. And how, so, how so, do you define yeah. ethical AI? Like, well, what do you think needs to go into considerations around yeah, the ethics I of think, AI? I think multiple things. There, there are, I think there are at least two factors that need to go into it that I haven't heard a lot of people talking about. Some people do, and I think it's good, but um, I think... Uh, one of them has got to be that we got to start thinking about people's uh, attention and their and their sort of their cognitive resources as a natural resource. And so any company that that seeks to either alter those resources or 
claim them should be thought of as an extractive industry rather than this idea that we have this sort of endless amount of time, and endless mental energy, and so we should just keep on going and going and going. Right. We touch our phones 2,000 times a day. Exactly. Why, why not touch them 3,000 exactly. times a day? No big deal, right? And what if the kids touch them? That seems fine, <laughs> right? No. I think we should instead <laughs> talk about this as a finite resource that we are extracting from people's lives. And so that I think that should begin governing people's thoughts about this stuff. There's a fabulous sort of re- research and design uh, group in Seattle called Artifact that put out this very cool – a uh, group of, of tarot cards, tech tarot cards. I can see you guys nodding, so you'd know about this, but they, they're they super cool. And anybody who's listening to this should go uh, to their site and check them out. Tech tarot cards, which basically they use as these sort of provocations with their clients to say, okay, if, you're, if your thing really works, if the product works and it reaches 100 million people, is what one of the cards say, called the amplifier, what effect will that have? Will it be net positive or net, benefit, net negative for, for society, right? These kinds of questions are... are Thinking of this as an extractive industry is something that we haven't really been doing yet. The other thing that no one is doing, uh, as far as, as I can tell, is thinking over time. What is it going to do to human beings to use a an automated system for making big decisions in their industry, in their family, wherever it is? What's that going to do to them? Not this quarter, but over a year, five years, ten years, right? All of the behavioral scientists say – the all of them is not correct, but because um, uh, you never get consensus, you get two of them in a room and they fight with each other. But <laughs> the consensus that I've seen that I seem to get from people is our cognitive abilities are like muscles, and if you don't use them, they go away. And so, if we hand off really important decisions to an automated system, you're going to see us lose the ability over time to make those decisions ourselves. So, I think in any gaming out of what an AI system can do for an industry or do for an organization, we shouldn't be thinking about it in just one moment. We should be thinking about it long term. I think we have the math to figure that stuff out. We should start doing that. That's super interesting. Like stopping at a red light, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Stopping at a red light. Exactly. So yeah, for me, I, I, you know, it reminds me, you know, in the early days of physics, right? There was the ether, this idea that that you could compare any value to an absolute stillness in the universe. It was this imaginary stillness that, that we would all respond, you know, that, that everything was measured against. And then all the relativists come along, Einstein and the rest of them, and say, what is the ether? Where is the ether? Show me that. And the, and the old guys say, shut up, kid. You know, right. this, you know, this is how we've always done it. And then along comes relativity and the rest of it. And we figure out that, that over time, uh, you lose the math that you would need to basically in order to measure one thing, you got to give up the stuff that you need to measure another thing. And, and for me, I, I feel like our math got better such that we could, we could measure not just a location in space, but vector, right? Where the thing is going, all of these sort of relative measurements. And I feel like we are still right now in the phase where people are only thinking about the ether when it comes to AI. And they need to start thinking about the bigger relativistic math. Well, of it. to your first point, how do we tell companies, important companies in a largely attention economy internet, uh, buddy, to make less money? Yes. Well, I I just keep trying to say to people, I think there's enough money. Like I <laughs> I think you yeah, are yeah. going to see a lot of money. Yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about legacy. Let's talk about who you're going to what you're going to be remembered for. And I think I think we have some handy examples currently, right in the era of Facebook and the rest of them. You're seeing. CEOs walking into a room where suddenly they realize, wow, I've been the good guy my whole life and I am the villain of this story. And I think a lot of people are not, are not, I don't think a lot of people are comfortable with that. We're going to eventually, and this is why I think we can't rely on quote unquote ethics boards and the rest of it to sort of solve this problem. Um, we're going to get to a point where it's no longer cool to be a woke company hmm. and that's going to be a real problem when that happens. But for the moment, now that it's cool to be woke, uh, Let's stay woke, everybody, and say, hey, you know what? We're going to leave some money on the table because we want to be remembered well. We want to be on the right side of history. Yeah. yeah. That's a good reminder given that tomorrow is election day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Go vote, please, everyone. Please, everyone vote. <laughs> by this time, by the time you hear this, you'll have voted already. But <laughs> Don't listen to the polls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Jake, thanks so much for coming in. We yeah. really Thank appreciate you having you. I really it appreciate a, you having me. It was a really awesome conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. This segment's called I Roll Please, in which we take common Silicon Valley axioms and poke at them. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> Needle. Yeah, I think so. Kvetch. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Kvetch. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who listens to our podcast texted me the other day and said that my um my eye roll is on the podcast are like visceral. Oh yeah, she yeah. can see them happening. That's when our our previous <laughs> our, our guest Jacob. He what were we talking about? But yeah, I felt your eye rolls very visceral. You, you, you right to the sky. Not at him. Yeah. he was wonderful. No, no. Uh, so this one in particular, it's it's don't raise too much money. What are the why do people say this? Is there ever such a thing as, quote unquote, too much money, more money, more problems? I think this kind of goes into the general category of random shit that the entrepreneurs get for advice from from either investors or people who are preparing them to to talk to investors. There's there's just a bunch of these kinds of things, but it's actually really frequent. I, I will often uh, hear entrepreneurs uh, worried about whether or not they're going to take too much money. In fact, the... Uh, I think just last week I had this discussion with with one of the people in uh, uh, kind of in our portfolio that was uh, getting around closed and was worried about whether or not they had, uh, you know, maybe they should take less. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, that the general worry is just, you know, a little bit too much dilution. You know, maybe you're setting expectations too high. You know, there's like plausible reasons why you wouldn't want to raise kind of too much. Um, but yeah. I've never actually seen a case where anyone's regretted it. Like I've never, I've never seen or experienced or heard of someone who said, damn it, I, I wish I had taken less money from like highly qualified investors. Sure. I, mean, I don't I think that's ever been uttered. I, I wonder if it's just the the fear of losing control of the thing you're building Ta, because of control. all those millions of dollars be, being put in by other people. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of these kinds of fears. I mean, control is kind of illusionary anyway. You, you have no control of any ideas as soon as you, you know, as soon as you've, you've said them out loud, you, you've pretty much given up control. Um, Never really had one anyway. In fact, all of I think entrepreneurship is probably a, a balance between the the illusion of security and the illusion of control. Uh, and you just like pick one, pick whichever one you want to believe in most, but <laughs> you don't really have either of them. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's. Yeah, do you want more investors around the table? Are you like giving a you know control of the board, which again is also kind of illusionary? Is it too much dilution? All of these hypothetical things. But uh, honestly, like I've heard a lot of people regret not taking enough money. Sure. And I've heard people regret taking money from poor quality investors. Like usually if you have a bad feeling about an investor, like when you're just like negotiating, like it's not going to get better once they're an investor, like kind of on their best behavior before they give you money. So if you're already kind of feeling queasy beforehand, then that's probably a good reason not to take money from those people. But I've never, I've literally never once heard someone say, you know, if I can go back and do it over again, I would have taken less money from, from high quality investors. So I think if you're like lucky enough to have an offer, I would... I would just take it. Well, it kind of seems like the high quality piece of the investor is probably the most important thing and not how much money you're taking. Yeah, like what are the self-selecting questions the entrepreneur has to ask themselves? Maybe how much do I need for two years? Because whatever they raise, they're just going to spend it anyway in that time frame. And yeah, probably are are these people going to be able to help me? The way to think about uh, how much you need is probably not so much in terms of time, uh, but it's in terms of like, what are you going to accomplish with it? Like, especially at an early stage, it's like, what are you going to do with, with this amount of money that's going to make your company worth, you know, 10 times more at the end of it? And, right. You know, if you can do that in six months, then that's great. And if it takes you three years, then that's fine. But you, you want to raise enough to get to the next major milestone where you're obviously, uh, you know, worth a lot more. And however much money you think you need for that, I would add a little bit to that for padding and then... If you can get, you know, clean terms with high quality investors, I would, uh, I would take it. Take it. Take the money, kids, and run. Now it's time for a listener question. This one comes from our subreddit, uh, slash r slash all turtles. We have a subreddit? We do. <laughs> How many people are on it? <laughs> Three or four. A solid handful, Yeah. yeah. And this question is, with the pace of improvement seen from the likes of Boston Dynamics, when do you see the dexterity problem being solved in such a way that robots come out of labs and niche applications and into everyday life? 
always with the robots. Yeah. We all want to know when we're going to have like yeah. either robot robot handmaidens or robot overlords. Boston Dynamics is doing amazing, like innovative work in abusing robots in a way that's going to like come back and hurt all of us <laughs> once the robots actually take over. Yeah, like that's a really bad idea. I'm yeah. not sure like Those why videos, they think. It's, yeah, yeah, you take down all the compilation videos. Well, now. it's too late. Like when, <laughs> when when the AI gets here, it's going to have access to the Wayback Machine. Right, like, right, it's, right. it's already it's already out there. <laughs> Boston Dynamics is going to like is going to be. The primary genesis of the of the of the robot yeah, uprising. They're just going to tip us over constantly. Yeah, but this is an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think we talked about before about how um, a kind of human scale dexterity is something that robotics is really, for the most part, lacking right now. That robots are really good at very very precise kind of micro precision stuff, and they're pretty good at like giant things. So they're good at you know dealing with DNA in cells. Actually, right. not really. But they're good at like microassembly and they're good at like moving shipping containers around, but they're not really good at like what we would think of as human scale things. And that's a, that's a significant um, a significant shortcoming. Uh, Maybe we should stop making human scale robots. Well, it's also, I think, um, you know, human scale kind of dexterity is probably the weakest business case like right. there's, there's like not really a great reason to do this because there are there are already people there's, in the world that can do it softbank has pepper i guess that's unique pepper is is, is adorable yeah uh, <laughs> what is pepper? pepper it's this cute little robot that like follows it, you around and asks creepy questions and makes eye contact and like furrows its brow and... which which is like which is like my moves it's like stealing my moves pepper <laughs> That's my management technique, basically. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. A strongly furrowed brow. Yeah. I think um, I think for a bunch of reasons, the human scale movements are going to take the longest to develop, A, because they're hard, but B, because there's also, like, like, there's just less demand for them. Like, there's stuff that Boston Dynamics is doing, which is interesting around, like, exoskeletons and, like, you know, pack animals and things like that. But in general, like, we've talked about this before, we don't need to get rid of work for people. Right. Like, there are plenty of people that can do people like dexter dexterous things at the gas station across the street have you seen the security robot that's been out there yeah <laughs> they got rid of it because the homeless people get just kept tipping it over <laughs> because it's very tip overable it's a rolling kiosk i mean i i was sorry tempted to tip it over <laughs> well, when I yeah, saw obviously it. It's like the equivalent of a cow when you're in high school in the midwest yeah yeah. <laughs> like, yeah yeah those things are are exactly right like if it's a job that a person can already do really well and the way, he, the PSA, don't do that. They actually get really hurt and sometimes die. Oh, it's, I know. No, <laughs> okay. I would never do that. But, you know, Midwest. Sorry, I didn't mean to It was a robot cow. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Screw those things. Yeah. He's got to come in. Yeah, I think, I think um, so it, look, it, it's, it's going to inevitably happen. There's no, there's no like magic around, you know, what people can do with their hands and, and limbs. So robots are going to be able to do it. It's just, I don't think that's going to be, I don't think that's going to be where the most dramatic uh, developments happen over the next, you know, decade or two. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the more important part is kind of the interplay between the two or like how, how the two augment one another. There's that the Yamaha Piano Factory example is really, really cool. It's like these giant machines moving these, you know, thousand pound lathes of wood around. And then there's kind of old Japanese guys like fiddling the little hammers and and, and doing the, the precision work. Yeah. the uh, I think we, we talked about the Yamaha Piano Factory like season one or something. I don't know. It was almost, we yeah, did. I visited it a while ago, and it was, it's it's kind of good. There's a there's all sorts of really fascinating work that's I guess kind of human scale dexterity for robots, which is how robots can work alongside of people, like in manufacturing lines and things like that. Uh, like that's that's something that uh, you know even five years ago was pretty difficult. Usually, like if it was an automated line, it was it was kind of mostly automated. Like you wouldn't really see like people and robots working side by side because. Mm -hmm. You know, the robots didn't really know what, how to handle right, that. Right. And there is a whole bunch of really interesting work about how to make a robot just be able to function in close physical proximity with humans and, you know, have the right things happen. So um, uh, I think there's a, 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 lot of, a lot of cool things will come out of that. Yeah. And it's maybe not a last mile delivery robot. No, probably not. I think in general, the rule of thumb that we've talked about before is like if it's a job that a person can really do really well, just like stop trying to make a robot do that job. It's kind of pointless. Right. So that was a really great question. Listeners out there, if you have other questions, please email us, hello at all-turtles.com, or use Twitter, hashtag AskAT. Marie reads all the emails. That's right. I know because some of them get forwarded to me. <laughs> and that concludes another episode of the All Turtles podcast. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the wonderful Donatella Studios in San Francisco, California. Big thanks to Jake Ward for such a fantastic interview. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com or tweet us using hashtag AskAT. 
thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for production supervision and editorial management, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. 